Welcome to Preston New Road, the site of Quadrilla's shale gas exploration site here in the heart of the Lancashire countryside, not far from Blackpool as you can see. This is a unique site in the United Kingdom because for the first time there's going to be drilling horizontally into the shale rock. Quadrilla, a Lancashire based company specialising in the search for the hydrocarbons we need to keep our homes warm and industry going. Quadrilla believe that three and a half kilometres below me are trillions of cubic feet of gas that have been trapped in the earth for millions of years. Our aim today is to tour this site, see what's going on, bust a few myths and crucially to answer any questions that you might have. And with me to see through that operation is Eric Vaughan, the Well Services Director. Just before we start, Eric, a little bit about yourself. Well, I've been involved in oil and gas in the UK since uh, 1991. I first came over here to do hydraulic fracturing uh, back then, uh, this for a few years, and then I did another project uh, around 2000 uh, that we, we drilled some wells near Chester and in, in Ireland and Northern Ireland and did hydraulic fracturing on those. And then I've been involved in this project for about eight years, so my family and I have lived over here for the last eight years. Well, you've got masses of knowledge, but people will have questions as a result of that and if you do have questions for us please submit it in the chat box the details of that are below so now we're going to begin to explore this site and first of all Eric we're going to see how you protect the whole environment around here uh, and the site involved so we're going to go down to the corner over there and look at your protections okay To begin our tour, we've come to the edge of the site. The rig is over there in full operational mode. You might hear it from time to time. And we're going to concentrate on the environmental protections that have been introduced on the site. And uh, here we see lots of linings, Eric, so I imagine that's connected with that. Yes, so the lining, this, this is all part of the site construction. So the environmental protections actually start with the site construction. So when you build a site like this, the first thing you do is you scrape the topsoil away. Now the topsoil is stored in mounds on the outside of the walls. You can see that on the outside of the site. So that's the original topsoil is in place. That'll go back on the site when the site's uh, uh, recovered later. And after the topsoil is moved away, we did a, a soil stabilization that basically firmed up the soil underneath. And then on top of that, you start with a, a felt liner. So you can see a piece of felt here. Uh, it's a, just a thick felt. And then on top of that piece of felt, you get a piece of HDPE membrane, a heavy plastic liner, and that's what actually makes the seal. And then on top of that, more felt, and that's to protect the membrane from the gravel on top. Or so, any sharp objects. Or any yeah. sharp objects. Okay, before we start operation on the site, you actually test this membrane to make sure it's not leaking, there aren't any holes in it from the, from the installation process. So that, that, that's tested before we actually start using the site. And then on, on top of that membrane, of course, we have an aggregate or gravel. Uh, section and then of course it fills with rainwater well I, okay. I want to I see how effective your bund is Eric okay. uh, so if we move down here uh, we can see uh, we're into the autumn now and obviously it's been raining and uh, over here we actually see the contained water I imagine yeah yes so th this is the rainwater that's drained off the site okay so along this edge of the site you've got an open section like this but where we were standing before and where we're standing now underneath this is actually a French drain so all the way around the site, around all, every side of the site, there's a, a drain under the ground. So there's a perforated pipe, water percolates through the gravel, ends up back in this, this ditch. So any of the rainwater or, or there's some type of spill or something like that would work its way into this ditch. And we can test this water, right, before it gets taken away. So when we're in operation mode right now, even the rainwater, we haul away. So it goes to a treatment facility, a water treatment facility. Now, if there was, uh, uh, later on in the life cycle of the site, when we're not in operations here, there's a, a, a section of valves and drains that we can test the water and then the rainwater can just run off the site when we're not in operation. Well, I'm relieved to hear this, Eric, because given the Lancashire climate, if it wasn't pumped away, I could imagine you'd be all swimming to the rig before very long. Yes, yeah, so, so we also use a lot of the rainwater, so we don't, so we don't have to pump to truck it away because right now we're having to truck the water away so we're always trying to minimize our HTV movements or our truck movements so we can also use this rainwater so the drilling mud made up mostly the base water was rainwater okay when we eventually get to the hydraulic fracturing operations we'll also use the rainwater for that also so if we're in a section of the, of the operations that we use water then this is our first choice for the water and then if we've used all the rainwater then we also have mains water on the site 
for and it has the too. huge advantage of being free, sent from heaven there. Yes, yes, yeah, the cost of rainwater is much less to use. So. Okay, now I want to move on to discuss another area of uh, um, the w water issues, and that's if we look over here at this, if you don't mind me saying so, Eric, rather modest silver <laughs> tube here, uh, this is important in connection with the other water issue, which is the groundwater. Yes, so, you know, of course, the main purpose of this membrane, the reason we seal the site is to protect the groundwater and surface water. So nothing can leak off the site or leach off the site. And we also want to monitor that, to, one, to make sure this is effective. And then also, so around the site, we've got four of these water monitoring wells, basically in each corner of the site. They go down to two different levels in the strata that, that could potentially have uh, groundwater or shallow surface water and then we monitor those so actually inside the tube you're actually looking at the top of the well so inside the tube then there's instruments in there that check for for methane and and we can we can see if there's any methane leaking from the well or, or things like that so you know if we would detect a, a uh, something different than the background level all the time, then so, that'll, that'll, so that'll just, alert just us to, stop to be you, able... There, there, is, there is a natural level of methane, is there? Yes, yes, so there's... there's so methane comes from very, various different sources, so the natural methane, or na natural gas is natural methane, but normally in, in shallower sections, just the decomposition of organic material, you know, you know where you know, the grass from years ago that's, that's further down, uh, you know, there's various... Uh, uh, you know, wildlife and, and cattle, things like that around we this area. don't need too much detail. Yeah. I think so we, I think <coughs> so anyway, that, that will give off methane. And, and you also see uh, those methane levels will change depending on the atmospheric pressure, depending on the tides, how the water level changes in the ground. So you're tracking all that all the time. It gives you a nice background level. So before we start hydraulic fracturing operations, we have to monitor that methane level in the ground for a year to get a nice background so you can see as that goes up and down. Now, we have a, a place on our website that you can go and look at the different readings on that for, for all the different things we monitor, but that's one of the things that's on the site that you can go look at. Could, could you just um, clarify for us, because it has been a, a point of contention about the uh, um, uh, possible connection between the water supply and what you're doing deep un underground here? Yes, yeah, so like where the shale gas or the shale itself is, is, is very much farther down than any potential, say, potable water or drinking water supply. Now, where we are right now, the drinking water supply doesn't come from this area anyway. Okay, most of the drinking water supply is actually coming from the Lake District and, and from, surface, from surface water. There are some underground water wells, but they're a, a fair distance away from here, and actually on the other side of a fault boundary, so that even the surface water is not connected between the two. So, but, uh, you know, there are concerns that, that, that somehow that what we do is going to, you know, say have fire come out of your tap when you turn your tap on. So if you're on mains water, there's zero chance of that ever happening. Okay, so it is possible in some areas to have methane from a well get into groundwater, but you have to have a water well right very close to the oil and gas well, and you also have to have the right geology for that to happen, which we don't have in this area either. So, so there are lots of different protections for groundwater and surface water and drinking water. And in this area, and, and especially in northwest of England, you don't have those issues that, that you would have, say, in different parts of the world, some of the places that happened in the States, like very early in, in shale development. So we looked at what's being done to protect water. Now what about noise? What's being done to help the neighbours around here, Eric? So we have different, different levels of noise protection. Uh, so we saw the around the sites, the four meter wall that is a noise, noise wall. And then also we have walls like this. So this is a, a 10 meter wall behind us here. And that takes some of the noise from the drill rig. Of course, it prevents it from going in that direction. And then some of the other equipment has different noise mitigation around the equipment, like the top drive has a shroud around that. And there's different, different uh, say noise mitigation for different, different areas. Are you monitoring the noise levels? Yes, we have noise monitors both on the site and around the site, off the site. And uh, so we record the noise uh, to make sure that the noise that leaves the site is within our permit. 
Eric and I are now live here on what's a very busy day on the site and our first session of answering your questions is going to focus on those environmental issues that we picked up going around the site and the first question comes from Jim, Eric, and it concerns uh, tanker visits here. We were talking about the water earlier on and Jim's uh, concerned about the number of movements taking wastewater off the site. Um, what's the future for all that? So. The, the water right now, because the rainwater gets trapped on the site because of the impermeable membrane, so of course we have to take all the rainwater off the site if we can't use it on the site. So we try and use as much of the rainwater as we can to mix drilling mud, or once the frack operations start, uh, you'll be able to use the rainwater for the fracturing, to use for fracturing water. And then uh, long term, once the operations are done on the site, like the drilling and the fracturing, uh, we will be able to treat the water or check the water because rain, basically it's rainwater runoff, and then we'll have to get a permit to discharge off the site, the same as any other. Uh, but that would site. be pure rainwater. Yes, yes, it? rainwater. So you have to you have to be able to check it and test it, and then and then uh, if it's just rainwater, it can discharge off. Uh, really long term, you would want to be able to use reuse water on the site and make, and treat it for whatever purpose you're going to do. If you're doing additional hydraulic fracturing or more drilling, that type of thing. You, try and reuse as much water as possible. Now I've got a question from Diane and it's about silica sand and also about the possible dangers to, of silicosis and, 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 and further beyond that the influence on drinking water. Okay so, so sand and drinking water, uh, there, there is no risk in, in drinking water so the risk from, from the silica sand is if it's a dust and you, and you breathe in the dust. Okay, so uh, uh, the really fine particles of, of, of the silica sand can get in your lungs. You can get uh, a disease called silicosis, and but it, you really have to be in, exposed, uh, say, in an industrial type setting. So it'd really be the, the workers as opposed to the general public. And then, of course, you know, for the workers on that, we have different you know processes to, to basically to, to, to keep the dust out of, out of their areas, or they can wear uh, uh, PPE or personal protective equipment like a dust mask if they're in an exposed area. So that that type of sand is also used in other industries. So it's used in glass making and foundry sand. So it's pretty commonly used in, in industrial processes. So there's lots of different uh, mitigation ways to, to keep the workers safe. I've got a question now from somebody who hasn't, hasn't given, given their name about radioactivity in water and how much of an issue is that? Okay, so the water that goes, that goes in the wells when we do the hydraulic fracturing process, the water that goes in the wells is either mains water or the rainwater from the site. But when it's in the shale, it picks up, you know, uh, say, uh, say, basically dissolved minerals from the shale itself. And then when that comes back out, it's got that, those minerals with it. Well, shale itself and, and those minerals are very slightly radioactive. So it would be similar to like granite countertops. Uh, if you go up into the hills, it's what's on the surface. But for uh, monitoring purposes and, and, to, and to make sure that uh, the environment agents can keep track of, of any potential radioactive fluids, even though it's very low levels, with those minerals in the water, then we have to take it to a, a treatment facility that can, that can handle that, so they're permitted to handle that. And what they basically do is take the minerals back out of the water. So they'll flocculate it, which is a similar process to what they do with drinking water, and it takes the minerals out, they clump together, they fall to the bottom, so then the water can go one way, and the minerals themselves are basically the rock. So then they can be disposed of. Okay, I'm not getting the names of some of these questions that are coming through, but um, this is a question about uh, air quality uh, 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 here. Obviously, uh, you know, it's an industrial site and so on. Uh, what are you doing to monitor air quality? So around the site are air quality monitors. So they've been in place actually since before we started any work. And, and of course, the, the, the emissions from the site are, would be dust, although most of the time the site's not very dusty because it's, it's wet on, on the top. And uh, so we monitor for dust. Uh, we also monitor in, for, for methane. You know, we're not in a place in the well right now that has any methane. There's no gas in the well yet. So, but if there were, if there was some type of leak on site, you, you would be able to see that around. And we're really looking for, for, I would say, fugitive emissions, very low level emissions, like a, a leak on a valve or something like that. We'd be able, if you can't pick it up by, by looking directly, you'll be able to see stuff around the site. It would come up on one of the monitors. Uh, it also monitors for some of the particulate matter, like diesel exhaust, uh, uh, say PM 2.5s or PM 10s, they're, they're called. PMs. Yeah, uh, uh, it's like particulate material. Sorry. I can't remember the, the exact, but it's a very, very tiny. Uh, the material that comes up from like diesel exhaust, they monitor for in London, and that that's one of the concerns down there, in the inner city of London. 
I've got another question here about methane leaks. I think this is looking a bit forward uh, down, d d down the process. I mean, if you get methane leaks as you get into the uh, gas bearing rock, uh, how are you going to handle that? So it would really depend on how the leak happens. I think most the people are concerned or they want to know how will the well be secured and how do we seal the well. And one of the things to remember is by the time we get down to the level where the methane is, that gas is actually coming up an inner string of pipe. And then that pipe is inside another pipe, which is inside another pipe, which is inside another one, depending on where you are in the well. So the first thing you see is actually a leak inside the well. It goes from one part of the well to the other. So we have different ways of monitoring for that. And, and, and then you can replace a section of pipe or something like that. Uh, I mean, the other concern is if somehow methane can get all the way out of all the layers and then outside the well, can you do anything about it at that point? And you can. So there's various different ways that you can go back in and identify where the leak is coming from. And, and then you basically seal it back up, either with cement or you can take pieces of pipe out and put different ones in. But there are various different ways of, of taking care of that. Now, people will have seen earlier on um, us going around the site and looking at the membrane and that sort of thing, and you obviously said it's very tough and so on. But how can you check under this site, because this membrane's under us here, how can you check that it hasn't been pierced by anything? I know you say it's resilient against sharp rocks and so on, but how yeah. can you be sure? So, so they actually have a system to test for that. So we tested that, I'll say, before we started operations. So you test to make sure it was installed correctly. Mm -hmm. and, and there are companies that that's what they do, is, is test that type of thing and then we also have the water monitor wells around the edge of the site so you know if if something somehow could leak from the site now of course right now there isn't anything to leak so you first you'd have to have some type of spill so then you'd be concerned of what the spill like you know, most likely would be like some type of diesel spill from one of the hgvs that comes on the site somehow they spill their fuel tank and then then you would recover that stone that had the, the and you know do a normal cleanup of, of, of a diesel type spill and then you'd also be able to check the membrane at that point but then you're also monitoring on those water wells if you saw something like that in those then you would know that you had to do further remediation to make sure that uh, you know nothing can leave the site question from tony uh, what is the distance between the water table and the area that you're drilling so the I say in this area where where we are there really isn't isn't any drinking water aquifers right underneath us. Even the the areas where, say, the formation where you, you get drinking water, if you go farther to the northeast on the other side of a fault, that formation underneath us that would be the, what's considered an aquifer, where they have fresh water, is not connected to where we are. So that same formation underneath where we are here is full of, of, of brine, saline water, very saline water, saltier than the sea. And then if you go another Know, 10 or 15 miles offshore that's the same the same formation is what they produce the oil and gas offshore from so and the reason they can do that is that rock is permeable it can hold water and that but here it, it, it's saline water salt water underneath us and then so from even from the bottom of that if you considered that uh, say say a potable water aquifer even if you, which is the way we treat it then you go down below that and we're still Oh, uh, probably a thousand meters or so before you get to the, uh, the hydrocarbon, the rocks that have the hydrocarbons in them, and uh, that we're that we're targeting, and then and we're actually a bit further down than that, the ones that we're actually targeting. And that water doesn't come up. No, water wants to go down mostly, and uh, but again, that you know the rocks where we are exploring the, the shale itself, and, and those rocks are we we say they're very dry. They're they're they don't have much water in those at all. I mean all all rocks, all material has has a tiny bit of water that's you know part of the formation of the rock, but it can't move out or can't move through the rock. And so the the very shallow stuff we're we're a long way away from that. Um, I think someone's joined us who may not have heard your earlier answer to this, but just to fill it out a bit more, how do you ensure that local air quality isn't going to be affected? So again you know, basically by monitoring so we can monitor to show what the air quality is uh, basically around the site so you can see uh, the monitoring on one side of the site versus the other you know which way the wind's going so you can say well this, I know you've got old-fashioned wind socks up there you know, yeah you, you always have a wind sock on, on a site <laughs> but around the site are the various air quality monitors and actually if you go on our website you can see that some of the results from those air quality monitors on, on, the, on the environmental page on the website Thank you, Eric. Well, we'll have more calls uh, after we've seen our next section of film where we're going to look at the actual equipment that's used in this drilling operation, starting with the drill bits.
the big drill bits which really uh, drill into the ground and this has seen some action with the Lancashire Rock, Eric. Yes, this bit was used to drill one of the shallower sections of the hole. So this, this style of bit with the, with the three lobes on it, a tricone bit, uh, these lobes rotate. So as the bit and the pipe go around and around, each of these will rotate around. Those teeth will dig into the rocks, break the rocks up into little smaller pieces, and then they'll get circulated back up out of the well. So different kinds of bits are used for different style of rock or different hardness of rock and different sections of the well. But inevitably the teeth do get worn. Yes, the, the teeth on, on all drill bits are the, will wear out the drilling surface on the bits and then you have to basically pull everything out of the well, change the bit, run it all back in. So the deeper you go, the longer that process takes. Now beside you are smaller ones. <clears throat> yes, so these bits uh, were the next hole section after that. Uh, they're a similar style bit, same thing. These have uh, uh, carbide teeth on them, so a little stronger uh, for maybe a little bit harder rock. There's some carbide buds around the outside, again, to keep the sides of the bit from wearing off as it scrapes down the side of the, the rock. You can imagine the hole is exactly the same size as the bit as it goes down through there. Okay, well, um, we've seen quite a lot of the um, used ones here, but over in this corner here, we. Uh, I think we'll be able to get an impression of what these bits look like when they're first used. And uh, this looks like gold, Eric, here. I well, that's be. just paint, though. Oh, right. So, <laughs> so, but there, yeah. is di there is diamond in them, their teeth. Yes, yes. So this is a PDC bit. It's a different style of bit than the ones we were looking at before. So the diamonds, uh, uh, polycrystalline diamond compact is what PDC stands for. So it's got uh, uh, manufactured diamond studs that go around the edge of the bit. And of course, those are very hard. They don't wear out as, as fast as, a, as, as, the, as the carbide bits. But this type of bit, instead of, instead of having teeth that go and break up the rock and chip the rock up, so this basically scrapes the rock away. So those diamond teeth are very, very hard. They can just scrape a little, shave a little piece of rock off every time that bit goes around. And then you have all kinds of different styles of even this kind of bit with like a different number of lobes or different diamond count and all, all, there, there's a whole science to, to drill, doing the drill bits. And these are industrial diamonds, they're not the sort yeah. of thing you buy for your wife. Yes, that's correct, yeah, it would, it would make a very good ring. How, how many bits do you think you might use on this project? Uh, you could use, it, it depends on the sections of the well, so you, you know, in theory you'd want to use a, diff, a different size, one bit for each different size of the well, so in this case there'd be five different, different bit sizes, but uh, especially on exploration wells you're, you're using different bits to basically try different technology. Like I said, there's lots of different styles of the bits. So you'll try different bits in the hole as you go through different sections. And then also one section of this, of this well, we're doing coring, which means we'll have a bit like this, this, a bit this style, except it'll have a big hollow section up the center. So that as it drills down, it'll, it'll drill around a section of rock and leave a rock tube left up in the middle, which will actually come up the inside. It'll go up the inside of the drill pipe and, and there's, we have special tools that will actually go down and retrieve that rock down the inside, from the inside of the drill pipe, bring it back up to surface. And of course, that's of great interest to your geologists who you've got on site here. Yes, the geologists will absolutely be out here for that part. And uh, so they actually get to see the rock as it comes up to surface. We have a lab on site, so the rock, as soon as it comes up to surface, it goes into the lab. It goes into, into canisters that we can measure how much gas is actually in the rock, so physically measure the, the properties of the rock physically measure how much gas is in the rock, and that also helps us to figure out how much gas is in place under the ground. Any results yet? Well, from the wells we did uh, a number of years ago, we have some of those results, which is how we, we came up with some of the different numbers of how much gas is in place underneath us now. So we've seen the drill bits that are going down that rig, but the pipe work is absolutely crucial to this whole operation in a number of different respects, which Eric, perhaps you could now explain to us. Okay, so to clarify where we are in the well right now, we've finished drilling the, uh, the deep surface casing. So we're down just below 1300 meters below the surface. So right now the drill bits out of the ground, we saw the drill bit earlier. And so the drill pipe is also all out of the ground. So right now the drill rig itself is getting ready to run the casing that'll go in and, and 
be cemented in place to protect the, the groundwater and any shallow aquifers, anything like that. So these, so, these pipes have been down uh, right under the ground? Yeah, so these, these all just came out of the ground recently. So this is what we connect together. This is the drill pipe itself. This is, goes from the, the top drive up on the, on the rig floor. That gives it the power to turn the drill pipe. So all these pieces of pipe, they're uh, uh, all connected together. They just go one after the other, stack on top of each other, down to the drill bit. To drill, to drill the rock, and, and the mud circulates down the drill pipe, back up the outside, and over to the mud system, which we'll see. And each one of these pipes has to be connected, stacked on top of each other, all the way down, and then all the way back out. So every time we change that drill bit, everything comes out of the ground, you put a new bit on, and that goes down. There's different kinds of pipe. So the, the normal drill pipe, which makes up most of the drill string, and then there's also uh, drill pipe that's called heavy wall drill pipe that's heavier and then at the very bottom there are drill collars which look similar to that but they're a little smoother but they're even heavier and that gives the weight on the bit to be able to make the bit dig into the ground. Most of the pipe is in tension, it's being pulled and held up by the rig and then you just let that heavy weight pipe at the bottom, let that weight go down on the drill bit to put 10 or 15 tons of weight, depends on what part of the hole and what size of bit, uh, on the bit to, to let the bit dig into the ground. Now now that all this is out of the ground, so this hole's drilled right now, to, down to again around 1300 meters, and we're getting ready to run the casing in the ground. So the casing is what stays in the ground permanently, and that's what's behind okay, us here. Okay, well let's, let's move, let's move um, over to, to the uh, actual casings, and this is what's going to uh, protect the environment from um, the actual hole itself, yeah? Yeah, so this is 13 and 3 8 inches in diameter casing. So this will all go in the ground. Uh, this weighs about 72 pounds per foot. So it's fairly heavy. <laughs> and uh, the, the casing that, that's in the ground now that goes down around 250, 260 meters, it's 20 inches in diameter. So that's been in the ground, cemented in place. This will go down the inside of that, down to that 1,300 meters, and then at, once it's all in the ground, we'll pump cement down the inside of the pipe. It'll go down the inside of the pipe, up the outside, and be squished in between the pipe and the rock face, the, the hole that we've drilled, and then the cement will come all, on this particular casing, the cement will come all the way back up to the surface. So this piece of pipe will be basically sealed in the ground with, uh, uh, say, special blends of cement that, that uh, block gas channeling, or they expand a little bit, and they keep that they keep the casing protected and then they also seal that casing in the ground. Now where we're at now, we haven't made it to where there's any oil or gas or anything like that yet. So, But what about the actual uh, setting of the concrete? I mean, that's, that's quite a critical thing. You obviously want it to remain fluid and then at some point it's going to set. So the timing of all this must require a great deal of skill. Well, it requires a great deal of science. And, and so you look at all these different cement blends and, and there are different companies that, that do this. and and you put different additives in the cement that change how thick it is and how thin it is. So it has to be thin so you can pump it. It's not like uh, like if you, oops, if you like pour a, a wall. Yeah, yeah. It's not like you pour a concrete slab on surface and the cement comes out in a big ready mix truck and all that's been done and it comes out and they pour it on the ground. It's already got gravel in it and things like that. So this is cement, not concrete. Okay, so, and we mix it on the site. So it comes out as a, as a dry powder and we have special equipment that, that mixes it as we go, has different additives that put, you put in it to change those properties so it's either thick or thin, how long it takes to set, that kind of thing. And that gets pumped and of course it has, you have to have a special pump that will pump it at high pressure. So if you can imagine we're pushing the cement down but then we've also got to lift it back up 1300 meters so it'll have several thousand psi of pressure to push that cement back up, back up the hole. Now, once the cement goes down the inside of the pipe and up the outside, you don't want the inside of the pipe filled with cement. So you displace that cement out of the inside of the pipe with uh, either drilling mud or water or, or a non-hardening fluid. And, and you, there's actually a big rubber plug that goes in between those different fluids. So you'll pump the cement and then you have a rubber plug that wipes down the inside of the pipe. And then that keeps the cement and the water or the cement and the mud separate. That goes all the way down to the bottom. There's actually a special piece at the bottom that that sits into and locks in, and then that locks the pipe in place and, and locks and seals the bottom of the pipe. And then all the cement, you have to basically you sit and you wait, depending on how you mix that cement and what additives you put in, and you have to wait. Usually it's around eight to ten hours. The cement's hard enough 
that, that the pipe can't move, everything's sealed up, and then you can go in and start drilling out the next section of the well. Thank you. Right, well, I'm sure that's clarified it for many of you, but just in case you need further clarity on this procedure, let's watch a short video to explain what Eric's just been telling us. Our detailed knowledge and understanding of the local geology, acquired from previous exploration and surveys, helps us to locate our wells. The target depth of the wells is approximately 3,500 metres. To put this depth into perspective, it is at least 20 times the height of the Blackpool Tower. Depending on the well, drilling can take between one and three months. Our wells are lined from top to bottom with secure, protective and durable steel casings that are cemented into place. On some of our wells, we may want to drill a horizontal extension to help us to reach more of the gas in the shale rock. We do this by gradually curving the path of the well, moving from a vertical to a horizontal path. Well, I hope that video helped explain what's going on right below our feet now. Uh, we're going to continue answering your questions, and thank you for sending in so many, by concentrating on the actual drilling procedure. And Eric, the first question is about this horizontal drilling, which is unique. Uh, this is the first one in the United Kingdom, but how do you do it? Well, so it's the, it's the first one to target shale in the UK, but we drill off offshore, we use horizontal wells all the time. The UK actually used to have the world record for the longest horizontal well, and that was back in the 90s, that, from, that started off in Witch Farm down in the southern part of the, of, the, of the country. But most of the time when you're drilling, you're using the top drive, the, the power at the top of the rig, to turn that, that drill string, to turn that drill pipe, to, to turns the bit at the bottom. So the power to the bit is actually coming from the surface and is, is going down, down that piece of pipe. Now to drill around a corner to make it go horizontally or, or any angle, you need to change that power from the top to the bottom. So we put what's called a motor at the bottom of the drill string, right above the bit, and so that when we pump the mud down the drill pipe, it turns that motor and then that turns the bit. So instead of turning the whole pipe from surface, you're only turning the bit. And then if you take that motor or, or down near the motor and actually bend it just a little bit, so maybe just a degree, then that means that the drill bit wants to follow a curve. So you hold the drill pipe still, point the bit in that curve that you want it to go, and then it'll try and follow that curve. When you want it to go flat again, then you can turn the whole drill pipe, and then that angle goes away. But you have to, you have to lower a motor down? Well, the motor's part of the drill string. Oh, right. So it looks like, it looks like a piece of drill pipe. You don't see it from the outside. The, the motor's actually on the inside, and it actually works from the fluid going through. There are other ways of doing it, but that's, that's the most common way. That's the way we're using on this particular well. Now, our next question is, for me, <laughs> as a layman, the most technical one so far. You'll have to explain this one, Eric. It's from Kate. Uh, what? Uh, is a cement bond log and how are you planning to use them on this well? Okay, so uh, a cement bond log or, or really uh, it's called a cement evaluation log. There are many different kinds of logs. A bond log is one type. But what, what they do basically is you're trying to, to go down after you've cemented the pipe in the ground. So you've got a piece of pipe, a layer of cement, and then the rock, the formation. Okay. And, the, and the cement evaluation log, most commonly what you're trying to do with it is to make sure that the cement is bonded to the pipe and is bonded to the formation. So you don't, it's, it's basically forming a seal. And so you run the logs in the different sections of the well to give you an, uh, an indication of, of how, how good that seal is and where if there's any places that there are gaps and that type of thing. So on this particular well, we'll actually start running uh, the cement evaluation logs actually after this, after this section. So this is a 1338. So this would be the, in the, uh, 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 the, the conductor, the shallow conductor, I'm sorry, the deep conductor section. And then from there on all the sections down below. And the next one also sounds pretty technical for me. Um, what is wireline logging and how will you use that on the site? Okay, so wireline logging, actually the cement evaluation log is done on wireline too. So a wireline is just a cable, a wire that goes down the well uh, that you can run from the surface. There's a, a unit on the site that has uh, basically a multi-strand cable 
you know, a communications type cable that they can they can hold weight in the lower instruments down in the well. So wireline logging is basically lowering instruments into the well. They do different things. Cement evaluation log is one. More commonly, what people are referring to are a lot of the logs that you run give you rock properties. They give you information about the rocks. So they can you can say uh, like say what the uh, say the density of the rock or what types of rocks you can tell from some of the readings, what type of rock, and you know how much water content or moisture content, uh, the salinity, uh, temperature, uh, all, all kinds of different things on the logs. So you'll, we'll run a, a huge suite of, of logs on different things, and the geologists can, can look at that, and the geophysicists and scientists can look at those, and they can tell what kind of rocks we're in, all, all kinds of information about the, about the actual formations without actually having to go down there and, and dig them out themselves. I should appreciate there's a lot of interest in this horizontal drilling aspect. Uh, somebody's just asking uh, how far horizontally uh, will the, uh, the, the, the drillings, drillings go? Okay, so these wells, we're, we're only going about a kilometer. We're, we're basically, uh, these wells are designed to go about one kilometer horizontally in the shale. And uh, you can, physically, we can drill further than that. Like I said, the UK used to have the, the world record. It was, I think, 9.8 kilometers or such. Uh, but the, these are fairly short. But what really restricts you isn't the technology to be able to drill. We can drill a long way horizontally, but uh, the rocks themselves, you have to find a, a place that the rocks are continuous and, and have the right properties for that kilometer or two kilometers uh, that you would try and drill to produce for an oil and, and gas And in well. which direction? So if you could relate it to the nearby countryside, that would be helpful. Okay, from this site, we're drilling almost due west towards the sea. Now you've got obviously got planning conditions for the amount of noise on, on this site. How, how do you ensure, I mean, it's a busy day today. Yeah. I mean, how do you ensure that today, for instance, you don't exceed your noise permits? Okay, so we have noise monitors uh, you know, off the site at the actual receptors, and then in between the, the site and the receptors, and then actually on the site. So you can tell, say from the, from the indications, mostly on the ones on the site, we have alarms, and, and, and I say early warning indicators that our noise level, what our noise level is, and we have those set so that they go off before our actual noise levels off the site. And then you're basically recording that information, and you're looking that pretty much all the time. There's somebody looking at that to make sure that you know if there is noise off the site, that it's not coming from us. Simon wants to know how long will operations take, and how long will you be on this site? So drilling operations should take roughly, probably, you know, close to the end of the year type of thing. Uh, sometime after that, we'll start the hydraulic fracture operations. Those are roughly about three months or so. And then after that, we'll go into the, the testing phase. Hopefully we'll have gas that comes out of the well at that time, and we'll be able to test that. And, and, and we've got uh, various different uh, plans in for, for different testing times. Usually you, you have to flare the gas initially, usually. And uh, so that goes to an enclosed uh, uh, flare system, it's actually an incineration flare that's on the site, so there's no exposed flames or smoke or anything like that. And uh, But we have to do that to ensure the gas quality, and eventually we'll be able to put the gas into the gas grid. And uh, then we'll actually be testing, uh, I mean testing, we're not testing the quality of the gas, we're testing the amount of gas that comes out of the well, and it can go into the grid and, and we can actually use it at that point. Yeah, I think that's quite an important point to make, because obviously the, the, all this apparatus will disappear, and I mean if, if everything goes as you want it to go, they'll just be a pipe pumping gas out into the main for how, how long? I mean, I suppose that's how long is a piece of string. Well, well, typically a shale well, if it, if it goes into production, they produce for a long time. You get the, the majority of the gas comes out early in the life of the well, but they have a very long, what we call a tail on the production. So it, it produces a, a, a gas for a long, long time. So you'd expect a typical shale well to produce in the 20 to 30 year range. It kind of There's lots of variables on that. It depends on how many other wells and, and the cost of production of the well. But that's, that's the, typically what you would look at for to get gas from one of these wells. That's what you would expect to, to be able to produce gas for that long. Zoe wants to know when you'll be testing the water, will you be testing the water during and after fracking operations? Yes, we actually test, test the water uh, continuously here. Like uh, I assume that she's meaning the water, like the groundwater protection, the groundwater monitoring wells, those are being tested all the time. We also test surface water around, I see all the time we're testing that. And then of course the water that comes out of the well, we test before it, before it goes to the treatment facility. Eric, thank you very much indeed. Do keep your questions coming in as Eric and I now complete our tour of this site.
We're now on the rig itself and we're going to begin by looking at how the mud that comes up from the ground is actually dealt with here. Now Eric, there's no mud in here today, but what stage of the process are we? Well, we're getting ready to run the casing in the ground, so we're not circulating any mud through the well at the moment. There's no pipe in the ground to circulate with. All the drill pipe is out of the ground. We're getting ready to run the big casing in the ground. Just to give people an impression, we did film earlier this mud actually coming up, which is quite a spectacular sight, actually. So we're seeing some of that now, but talk us through the sort of stuff that's coming up from under in the earth. Okay, when, when we're drilling, we're doing drilling operations, you're pumping mud down the inside of the drill pipe, goes down the inside of the drill pipe, through the drill bit, around the drill bit, and that cools the bit because the bit's grinding on the rock, so it keeps the bit cool. And it also takes up all those little ground up bits of rock and lifts them back up the outside of the drill pipe. So that comes all the way back up from whatever depth you're at, in this case around 1,300 meters, comes all the way back up, comes out of the top of the well, and then comes down this chute. So as it comes through here, we take various measurements. We're measuring how fast it's coming back out, so we know we're putting the same amount in as the same amount that's coming out, so we can measure that. And, and we also can make sure that there's no gas entrapped in the mud. And then there's uh, uh, different people out here that look at different parameters of the mud. So we have a mud engineer out here that just looks at all the properties of the mud, make sure that it's the right weight or the right thickness, the right viscosity, uh, all, a lot of different characteristics in the mud that we make sure that that's right. And there's also some sensors in here that go to different cabins on the building so that we can keep track of the, that information. I'd like to see how the separation between the rock and the mud is done, so we need to move to the shakers, I think. Yes. So the mud has come out of the ground, but it's still got all the rocks in, and this equipment here separates it out, basically, right? yeah? Yes, so we're in the shaker room, it's called. So these pieces of equipment are called shakers, and uh, what they actually are is a vibrating screen or a vibrating filter, I think like a coffee filter, the metal coffee filters. And you get different sizes of screens in, depending on what size of the rock cuttings and things that are coming out of the well. So for where we were above, the liquid mud and the cuttings comes out of the well and it basically pours down and then is divided out over, over these shakers. We, we so, have got some pictures of this, which we'll uh, lay in now as uh, you continue to talk about it, yeah. Okay, so the mud comes onto the shakers with the rock cuttings in it, they vibrate, it helps the mud fall down to the next level down, which is in the actual tanks. And then some of the cuttings would come across the top and they'll fall off the end here. So here's a bit of the, of, of the mud that's got some of the stone in it. So it's basically uh, uh, the gelled mud and this is, this is the size of the rocks that are actually coming out of the well. So they're, they're tiny, a little ground up, looks like sand usually. And uh, then they come over the edge, they get augered off here and then that goes into the system that, that contains all those cuttings, and then those cuttings would go off to, uh, uh, to be processed so they can go to a landfill. I was, uh, I was going to ask you what actually happens to the rock, because there's some skips uh, uh, out there in the yard. Is that, that takes yeah, it away? Does yeah, it? so the, the, the cuttings themselves will end up in the skips. The sip, skips are sealed, and then they go off to a treatment facility where they get cleaned a little bit more, and then the rock itself ends up going off to a landfill. Well, there's the mud that's circulating around this system, absolutely vital to the whole process. And Eric's now going to explain how that's actually done. Well, we're following the journey of the mud, glorious mud, and we've now come to the pumping area, Eric. Yes, so this is all part of the mud system. So what we're standing on is the actual mud system on the rig. So the mud came out of the well up there, came across through that through that pipe up there, it drops down through the different levels. We were over by the shaker room, so the mud comes down. That does an initial filter pass on the mud to take some of the bigger cuttings and stuff like that out. And then the mud starts going through this series of tanks that we're standing on. So there's a whole bunch of different tanks underneath us. Uh, there's more filtration that goes on on the mud. And what we're really trying to do is take all the rock cuttings that we've ground up that have come up with the mud. We want to take all those out so that we have fresh mud again to go back down the well. So as it comes through these this series of tanks. Because all this is reused, this mud. This is an yes, important yes. point to make. Yeah, so you have a closed system. It's just a circulation system that goes round and around. So in, in, in the old days, there were systems that they didn't do that, that they basically the mud went out into a pit and kind of got disposed of as it came around. But we don't do that now. It basically rotating the mud all the way around minimizes the, the amount of uh, materials that we have to use. And then so once the mud is does has the right properties, it goes in this last tank that we're standing on now and then it'll be able to go over to these mud pumps. 
So How the, powerful are they? So each one of these pumps is about 1,600 horsepower, and so it's pretty powerful. You figure the amount of horsepower your car has. And so this will take the mud and pressure it up and send it back up to the top of the rig and then down the drill pipe, through the drill pipe, through the drill bit, back up the outside of the drill pipe, and then back around and through the system again and rotates around and around. As you go deeper and deeper, the mud quality changes, particularly in relation to the water? Yes, so all wells that you drill, you drill on the shallow parts of the wells, the areas that could potentially have groundwater. Uh, in the area that we're in, there isn't any, any drinkable groundwater underneath us right here, but you treat it as if, as if, as if there were. So you drill with a water-based mud, just like they would drill a water well with. So that's what's in these tanks right now. Uh, once we go on to the next section of well, we'll change this mud out for an oil-based mud. As we get deeper in the well, we're going into rocks that are hydrocarbon bearing, so they have oil or gas in the rocks. And then we're using a fluid that has a hydrocarbon base to it. So it's a mixture of oil and water. It's about 70% oil and 30% water or salt water. And, and then that makes a, a, an emulsion or a thick fluid that we can use to, to carry those cuttings. You have other additives in there that make it thicker or thinner and uh, give it different properties, but we're trying to reuse that, that system all the time, just rotate it around the well. Now we're right up on the rig and we're at the, really the business end of this where the pipes that we've seen are actually connected and made to go into the ground. Now Eric, I've got old images of men turning pieces of machinery by hand, but all that's completely changed now. We've got really sophisticated equipment here, yes? Yes, so when we make the connections on the drill pipe, so this, this piece above us here, this is the top drive. Okay, so this has the hydraulic motors and the, and the, and the power that actually can turn the drill pipe. And it's also a bit of a crane, so it can lift the, the pipe in, in and out of the ground. So, and it goes up and down these tracks, so it can go uh, up to the top and then down to the bottom. And the pieces of pipe come up over the side and get connected onto that little bit up on the top there where the, where the threads are. Now, in the old days, we had big wrenches and, oh, that's and, what and, I'm and, about, and winches yeah. that connected yeah. the pipe and tightened it up. Now we use, it's called an iron roughneck, which is this red, red piece here which is a giant hydraulic wrench, basically, and it can reach around, grip the pipe, twist the connections apart, and or put them together and with the right amount of torque to make sure they're all connected properly. Then it moves out of the way, the top drive puts them back in the ground. So like underneath this table here, it goes down, straight down to the well. Now all this has to be controlled, and we need to go into the control room now, uh, which is given an unflattering name, which we'll discuss when we get there, because all this does need to be obviously regulated and kept under uh, surveillance. So yes, yes, the man that that's now. controlling that is right over here. Right at the heart of the operation here in the control center, Ingol, the assistant driller, is in charge of operations. And Eric, you unflatteringly call this the doghouse. That's not fair to all this high-tech equipment. <laughs> why is it called the doghouse? Well, actually, I don't know why it's called the doghouse. So it, it, they originally, a long, long time ago, they were called the knowledge center because all the permits and the work orders and all that were in here. This is where they really the only house on some of the very original drilling rigs, but somewhere a long time ago it, it converted over to the doghouse. So, so what actually is Ingold doing here today? So right now we're getting ready to run casing. So whether you're drilling or running casing, from in here he can control uh, most of the parameters of the rig, from the mud system to the, the top drive, where the top drives go up and down to control the weight on the drill pipe or the rotations of the drill pipe. And, and all the parameters that we use for, for drilling, or in this case, for running casing. We'll run the casing, would be the same, a similar type operation where we're lifting pipe in the air, connecting pieces of pipe together, lowering them down into the ground. So he can control all of that from in here. He's also, of course, got cameras. He can see different parts of the rig, and then a lot of instrumentation, so he can see you know, how much weight or pressure or rotations, torque, uh, all that kind of information is getting fed back in here. It also gets recorded and, and, and broadcast. We can see it in other places on the rig. Uh, the drilling supervisor can see it. And uh, so from in here... But the ultimate control is, is done in here. Yes, so the, say the physical control is done in here. So he can 
control all that with the, obviously the different uh, switches and knobs and levers that he can work with in here. Thank you. Very impressive. Well, that completes our tour of the site, and now we're going to do a final round of your questions. And the first one is a pretty fundamental one, really. Uh, comes from a lady called Danny, Eric, and she's saying, why do we need this gas? Why can't we just rely on renewables? Well, it's a, it's a good question. And you know, one of the things is renewables are electricity. So, But gas is a lot more than just electricity. So we also use gas for heat, and we use gas for industry. So roughly, only about a third of the gas we use goes to make electricity. So even if we, like, we're, we could switch our electric system to 100% renewables tomorrow, we would still be importing gas. And you can uh, look at, say, National Grid does a very good uh, study that they look at future energy scenarios out to about 2050. They have different versions of it, of whether, you're, whether we stay doing things the way we are or they go to their, like, their very greenest scenario. And even in that scenario, we still use roughly about 70% as much gas as we do now. So, so gas is just much more than, than electricity. And, uh, of course, you know, in the U.K., things like 83% of the homes have gas heat. And if we had to all of a sudden switch that to electric heat, we would need considerably more uh, electric generation capacity to be able to do that. Now, uh, Quadrilla have constantly emphasised the employment opportunities uh, here in Lancashire, and Tobias, who's uh, just contacted us, uh, clearly wants to be part of the team here. I mean, uh, <coughs> how, uh, how, do, how does he apply? Well, I mean, right now, especially in exploration, uh, because there aren't as many, say, oil and gas firms in this area, because there hasn't been very much oil and gas drilling here recently. Uh, so a lot of the firms are from, from other parts of the UK or other areas. And so most of the employment is, is from them. We have quite a few of uh, uh, local suppliers and stuff on, in this area. So you know, a lot of the employment is coming through, the, for, through them. And then really, I'd say the majority of, of, of local employment would really come if this develops and we're able to, to drill more wells. And then you get more and more, I would say, local uh, uh, industry or more, more companies coming into the local area. And they would, of course, they all want to hire local people instead of shipping people from, from far away and like that. So it kind of goes through a wave. Uh, you know, as, as that that's develops. not always been the case with all employers in the Northwest, yeah, I have to yes, say. Yes, well, that, 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 that's the case, in, say, certainly in oil and gas operations, you have a, you know, a, say, a transitory work group at the beginning, and then if it develops, you know, th those guys go off someplace else, or, and ladies, and then you have a more permanent workforce from, from the local area. Now, in the meantime, you can also uh, apply, uh, you can go through the contacts, I think they'll be on the website now, or if not, you can go through the information line. Uh, David has got a question about the seismic data. Um, how, 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 have you, how are you gaining it and how are you going to share, particularly the equipment that you use for measuring seismic movements? Okay, so, the, so, so that would be during the hydraulic fracturing phase. We have an array that goes around the site that measures the, the seismicity. And what that's really for is to be able to look at, say, the micro-seismic, the really small seismic events, and we can track those and make sure that, that they don't build into something bigger. And so the actual instruments, if you're interested in the actual types of instruments, those are in part what's called our hydraulic fracture plan. There's a little more detail on that. And uh, you, can, you can find that on our website. And then also, uh, you can also look on the, uh, the BGS, the British Geological Survey. They've got an array of instruments around too. Now you've explained how by horizontal drilling you avoid having too many sort of sites on the surface, but nevertheless there is a question here about how many potential sites could there be in this area. But I get that question quite often. One of the things people, a lot of people don't believe, don't actually know the answer to that, because what's one of the things that we're trying to find out by drilling these exploration wells. And one of the key things that determines how many sites is how close you can space them together, how far you can keep them apart. And part of that is determining the rock properties and how we can drill these horizontal wells. We can drill a long way, but the rocks have to be the right, uh, laid down the right way, and we have to be able to follow some of these, these layers in the, in the shale. And the longer we can, we can make those horizontal sections, then the further apart the sites are at surface. And some of that has to do with whether you can only drill in one direction or two directions. It, and so it will depend. I can tell you there would be a lot fewer sites than some of the numbers I've seen thrown out there. But uh, I mean, to, give, to give a number, it, I really can't actually give a hard number right now because we haven't actually done that because we don't know enough about 
about the rocks to, to put the spacing in there. Now we've got a question here about refracking. Mm -hmm. um, you know, will you need to refrack this site, for instance, and will it mean all this equipment that we can see beside us here having to come back on site? Well, actually, this equipment is, is gone during the fracturing process anyway. So this is the drilling rig. So when you're doing the hydraulic fracturing, so this, this would not need to come so, back. So this this to refract. Yeah. No, no, this, this only does the drilling part. And uh, but uh, yeah, there's a bee getting ready to attack you there. <laughs> and uh, but. Uh, the hydraulic fracturing equipment, typically, you only do the hydraulic fracturing process once. Okay? You can do refracts, they have done refracts, in, even in North America where they have many tens of thousands of these wells. Sometimes they'll go back in and do refracts on some, especially some of the very early ones they did, but it's more of a, because of some of the technology changes and, and, and how they do the fracks compared to the very early, early ones that they did. But I would say most likely you won't do a refrack on these wells. If you did, then yes, you would have to bring the frack equipment back on, but not, not all this equipment. Uh, question from Lee about how far what, what, what the, the fracking cracks will, will go from the actual hole, how far out into the uh, surrounding earth. Okay, like what, what's the size Rock. and the distance that the fracks extend? So it kind of depends on, on which layer of shale you're in, but I would be very happy if I can get my sand and my my hydraulic fracturing process to, to go out maybe a couple hundred meters away from the well bore horizontally and then it, again the height depends exactly on which layer in a lot of times you're constrained by the layers and uh, the, the hydraulic fractures don't like to grow between different layers of rock so if you can you know find a layer of shale that you like that's maybe 30 meters or 40 meters thick that would be really good so that would kind of contain the height on that if you got in an area that might be a little higher you know, maybe 100 meters high, something like that. Okay, okay. How, how, how and where, for, this is from Neil, how, how and where will the, sorry, I'm, I'm trying to hear that one. How and where will the frac field be treated? The frac, the, the frac the, fluid? The frac, frac fluid, fluid, sorry, I beg your pardon. Okay, so on the, <clears throat> because we're just doing the exploration, we, we can't really, reuse the fluid because we don't have another well to go to to, to reuse it. So for the exploration wells, we're actually taking the, the, the fluid that comes back out of the well. You'd expect somewhere between 20-40% of the fluid that you pump in to come back out. And, and that fluid has, has the minerals and, and salts from the shale in it that we talked about earlier that has to be treated properly to, to take that material out of the water so we can dispose of the water. So we actually take that off to an off-site uh, facility that, that treats water like that all the time. They actually bring water in from the North Sea, from the hydraulic fracturing that they do in the North Sea. They bring that water in to and uh, treat that there. Uh, I think this is going to have to be our last question. How many wells will there be on this particular pad? So our planning consent on this pad is for four wells. So we've got the, the first two are in this cellar here, and then we'll, we'll drill these two before uh, we can evaluate before we do, do the next two. Eric, thank you very much indeed uh, for all your uh, answers to the questions today. Now, we'll be putting a recording of this webcast up on our website very shortly. And also, we'll be keeping you in touch regularly, so do stay on the website. We'll be having more question and answer sessions as developments take place here at Preston New Road. But for now, thank you very much indeed for all your questions, and goodbye. <laughs>